All right, well, if you would, uh, if you want to open your Bibles, you can open it up to Luke chapter 5, and I uh, want to start by giving you a quick introduction. Uh, the topic is uh, obviously prayer, but I've titled it The Focus of Prayer. A topic on focus that is, uh, is very, very tough for me to preach on. And as we, as we think about focusing in general, I think it can be very, very difficult. And let me just start by saying this, that uh, we're probably all familiar with, uh, with the three letters ADD, right? Attention Deficit Disorder. And, and I think that there are probably a lot of people who, uh, who uh, I guess, suffer, or should I say struggle with, with pain, attention. And, uh, and I'm one of those people. And, and I don't know if I have a, a touch of ADD or if my mind just goes a, a, a million miles a, a second. But if you've known me very long, you'll probably say that, boy, that Pastor Joe, he's, he just never stops thinking about something and, and uh, could be just, uh, just the way I'm wired. Matter of fact, I, I, at, here at church, I, I tend to uh, get so distracted, I'll be in the middle of something and then I'll just walk the halls and I'll just pace the halls. And, and, and I'll start to think of, of new ideas and new things we can do and, and, and areas of ministry that we can, uh, that we can reach out for, to people and, 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 uh, and how, do we, how do we proclaim the gospel to a sick and dying world, right? And so my mind just kind of goes a million miles a second and, and I'm not here to minimize ADD because I think it probably is a real thing. I think there are people here that, that probably do struggle really with that. But I also want to say that I think that a lot of our attention, uh, our attention disorder, if you call it, or our attention problems come just sheerly through a lack of discipline. We just don't discipline ourselves to stay as focused as we should. And, uh, and I know going through school, uh, K through 12, was, was very difficult. I had a real tough time just staying focused. It wasn't until I went, uh, I went to school for my my undergraduate, my graduate stuff, that, that I was able to just dial it in and be, uh, I would say, even hyper-focused. Almost to the, to, the, to the other extreme where I'm so overly focused on something that I just won't let it go. And so as we talk about our prayer, communicating with God, and the focus of our prayer, I want us to remain focused as we think about this. We have to be focused when we pray. Let's face it, since prayer is communication with God, since prayer is communicating with God, we want to have our conversation with him dialed in, right? We want to dial in our conversation. So I've just got a, a few, couple of different points this morning. First of all, the pattern of focused prayer. The pattern of focused prayer. Now, I want to say this, that some of the, this information in the pattern of focused prayer Will, will sound or seem a little contradictory to what I'm going to preach on in the next couple weeks. But in a sense, it's really complementary. Okay? There is a pattern for focused prayer that we find in the Bible. And, uh, well, let's just start jumping right in here. We know that Jesus had set a basic pattern as he began to pray. Now, we know that there are other areas in Scripture where Jesus prayed. We know he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. We know that he prayed at the transfiguration. We know that he prayed at his own baptism. But these two items right here, I just want to look at in quick detail. Uh, Jesus prayed in the wilderness. Jesus prayed in the wilderness. In Luke 5, 15 to 16, But so much the more went there a fame abroad of him, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. Here's a great example of Jesus as he began to get busier in the ministry, in a sense, as he began to, to, uh, to preach and he became to be well known to the, to the communities surrounding the region of Galilee. Uh, and he began to heal and do these wonderful miracles. He began to be bombarded by, by, uh, by uh, people and by pressure in his life, right? So what he did, he says in verse 16 of Luke 5, he says, and he withdrew himself into the wilderness and he prayed. How wonderful is it to sometimes just get away into the wilderness and to pray. We notice in Luke 6, verse 12, that Jesus prayed on a mountain. It says this, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. 
He went out into a mountain and he prayed all night to God. Now, I love this. I think that this should be a pattern in our own lives of, of maybe just getting away for just a moment and, and getting away from all of the busyness of the world, right? Because we, let's face it, it's not going to slow down. We are going to continue to get busier and busier, and we need our times of, of refuge. We need to be able to get away, get an, an even an evening away to just pray with our Lord. R.A. Torrey said that nights of prayer to God are followed by days of power with men. And if you want power in your life, if you want to be a successful Christian, if you want to have a successful Christian life, it's, it's, it's primarily based on your ability to just time, get away and to pray to God. Sometimes just by yourself, just alone with God. Super, super important. There's a, an axiom when, uh, when buying or selling a, a piece of real estate, and many of you have heard this, uh, it's, it goes something like this, location, 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 right? It's all about your location when you sell a piece. You can have the worst piece of real estate in the world, but I tell you what, if it's on the ocean, it's worth a lot of money. And you can have the best piece of real estate in the world, but if it's in a swamp, it's probably worth nothing, right? It's all about your location, about being in the right place. And we find these patterns set up by our Lord, a pattern of, uh, of getting away into the wilderness, getting away into the mountain, and being alone for just a time. There is a, there is a pattern for focused prayer. There's a pattern for focused prayer. You know, while it's true that we communicate with God through prayer, uh, we also must understand that that this is a conversation. That we are, we are to have a conversation with him. And nobody ever likes to have a conversation where you feel interrupted, right? I mean, how many of you have been in the middle of a conversation talking to somebody and, and someone else sweeps along and, and kind of takes over that conversation? You ever been in those situations? You, you ever been in a, in a conversation and this is, this is true. I, I, I watched a, uh, it's, it's true because I watched it on YouTube. It's, uh, it's true because it's just the way it is. They have what's called a closed circle. You ever hear of a closed circle? You might have a person standing like this and, and a person standing like this, and, and this is kind of a, a closed circle. And uh, what ends up happening is, is if these people kind of pivot away like this, you've kind of opened up, and, and now other people can kind of kind of come in. How, have you ever been in a closed circle where you're talking to somebody like this, and then somebody over here just kind of stand, comes, stands right here? It kind of almost interrupts and just kind of almost hovers there and waiting for you. And, and uh, our, our kids, they, they, they do this. And they're under, under strict, uh, um, you know, I guess instruction to, to not interrupt, you know. So, so they come in and, and they just, they stand there at our side. And as I'm having a conversation, and sometimes they'll be like, just one moment. Yes, son, what do you need? <laughs> and, uh, but nobody likes to be interrupted. And as you are communicating with God, there needs to be a time where you can just, where, where you can just get away, where there's, where there's not all this external pressure. And, uh, you know, we can talk to God in a, in a variety of places, and this is true. You can talk to God and, and while you're driving. Uh, I, I, I recommend you don't close your eyes for this one, but you can talk to God and pray while you're driving. You can talk to him while you're in a checkout line and and uh, matter of fact, I do a lot of talking to God in a checkout line, and uh, most of it is uh, praying to intercede on the behalf of other people. Lord, help this family in front of me. I don't understand what's wrong with them. <laughs> and uh, you just look, for, if you just go to Walmart at 11 o'clock at night, and you will just have a, just a ball, and you'll pray a lot for people. I, I was there a while back, and, and man, there was this one family, and they were just cussing at their five-year-old sitting in, the, in their, uh, what is it, what is that thing called, in the cart. And I'm just kind of going, man, oh my goodness, I can't believe this. Like, that kid is in line now that you cussed at him, you know. <laughs> you wonder why all the kids cuss these days, right? Because parents are like that. Anyway, so uh, you just want a good time. You just go to Walmart, and you can begin to pray for these people, right? And so, but here's what's best. Here's what's best. It's not a conversation that you have in line uh, at Walmart with God. It's not a conversation you have with God while you're driving. It's that set-apart time alone with God when you can just talk with Him. Where you can just talk with your Heavenly Father. 
And can I say this, that I think that we need to work on this in our lives. I have not arrived, I have not achieved this yet. I try very hard to have my time alone with the Lord, but it is not perfected. It is oftentimes bombarded by all sorts of other activities and random thoughts that come into your mind. We need our time of, in a sense, isolation. Well, Jesus said that even prayer should be done in a closet. In Matthew 6, verses 5 through 6, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. You know what their reward is? Let me stop there. You know what their reward is? That, that people look at them and say, good prayer. Good prayer. This is Matthew 6, 5 and 6, verses 1 to 4 talk about almsgiving, that your almsgiving should be done in private and not publicly for everyone to see. You know why? Because he says in verse 2, I believe, of Matthew 6, uh, he says that you're, you shall have your reward. And you know what your reward is for that? That a, that a good job. Good job. Keep it up. So he says here in verse 5, you shall have your reward. But thou, in verse 6, but thou, when thou prayest, he says, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and the Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So when you pray, get alone with God, so you're not out there trying to be praised of men for your good prayer, but get alone with him. Have quiet time alone with God. Quiet time and quality time. And I think a lot, of, a lot of quality time comes from quiet time. It's when you are alone with the person you're talking with. Uh, this week we went out and went fishing with the boys. I, I think it was uh, Wednesday morning or something. I can't even remember. We, we, we uh, didn't catch anything. Well, yeah, we did. We caught a, uh, a snail. We caught a wood tick, and, and uh, praise God, we didn't catch a cold because it was uh, you know, pretty chilly out there, but, but went out there, and it was just quiet, you know? It was, uh, it was, you were out there, and it was just the three of us and Facebook. No, I'm kidding. I think I only looked at my phone when I posted the picture of us, and we were looking at a canoe. That was the only times I, you know, you, you, I covet as a pastor. It's just true. I'm not perfect, so I'm out there, and we're just, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm like, uh, someone explained to me, you're driving down the road and you see the cow and, and he's reaching the head through the fence and they're kind of eating the grass on the other side of the fence, you know, and, and, uh, and sometimes that's me, you know. Like I've got this, I've got the whole shoreline and I'm thinking if I could just be there, I'd be happy. And so I'm looking for the, looking for the canoe and, and things. But this is my time with the boys, right? This is my quiet, quality time with the kids that we're able just to break away the three of us and, and, and uh, we left the wife at home. The mom is at home. We've been married 15 years, so it's about time. And, and so, so we left her at home, and we just went out, the three of us, fishing. And uh, we just had a great time. It was a quality time because it was a quiet time. And sometimes our lives need to be more reflective. They need to be, there needs to be more uh, quiet time with our Lord. And we ought to be doing that. And sometimes we just need to have a, a place where we get to, a, a, a place where uh, maybe like a closet, as Jesus said here in Matthew 6, 5 and 6, a time where we can get away into a closet. You know, it's interesting. We have um, in, the, in the headquarter building, there is, uh, it's kind of a, a weird shaped building, and, uh, but you have to cut some corners sometimes, you know, in order to make it square. And so there's this one area in the conference room, and, and uh, I've kind of designated that my prayer closet. You know, I'm, I'm isolated from, from everybody, and uh, there's like several walls, and there's only enough room in there to turn around, basically. You can't do anything in this little space. And, and, but we had to do that in order to create a square room, a rectangular room for the conference room. And uh, so that's a place where we kinda, I can kind of get in there, and, and I can kind of pray. And, and I've done that a half a dozen times now, and I tell you what, it's really refreshing. It's really, really refreshing to get in there even this morning. Even this morning, I was in there before church, and I was praying, and I've got a list of all the people in church, and I, and I go down the list, and I pray for all people individually, and I pray for their kids. 
I go down this list and I just pray. It's not this a long, elaborate prayer, but I just pray and say, Lord, I pray this, and if something pops into my, in my mind, I say, Lord, I'm asking you to help this person with that. And it's just a wonderful time that I can just get away for just a moment in a closet and be quiet. Quality time with the Lord is not usually found in front of others. It's found in front of God. And sometimes we just need to get away. Now here's the application just to this point. Uh, here's what's important, that you find a place to pray. Find a place to pray. It doesn't have to necessarily be in a closet, but it has to be in a place that you are away from other people, from other distractions. Let's look at that real quick. Point two, the place of focused prayer. Point one was the pattern of focused prayer. Let's look at the place of focused prayer. Uh, here's a couple of things. First of all, we need to silence verbal distractions. We need to silence verbal distractions. This is really important. Mark 6.30, And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. Rest a while, for there are many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat, and they departed into a desert place by ship privately. Come aside and rest a while. We need to silence our verbal distractions. We can't be caught up in all of the things that are going on. The power of our prayer will be determined in large degree by our private retreats. We need to silence all of the things around us. And friends, it's not going to slow down either. It's only going to pick up. There's only going to be more distractions in our lives. The busier that we get, we're going to have bigger families, and we're going to have more vehicles, and, and we're going to have more things going on, and there'll be financial problems and health problems and, and all sorts of stuff, and, and there'll be people clamoring all the time trying to talk, and you know what we need to do? We just need to silence all of those verbal distractions. Gary Miller, a friend of mine, he wrote in a in a blog post back in 2009, that getting alone with God often requires getting away from others. Getting alone with God requires getting away from others. Now, we're not talking about absolute isolation from everything. We're not talking about a monk in a monastery. We're talking about a Christian in a closet. And at times, that's what we need to do. We need to be moving along this line of where can we go for, for quietness? Where can we go to have our private communion with God? Because our lives are busy. As, I, it's in, as our church continues to grow, and I thank the Lord for that. Now, we're not a big church. We're not like... Harvest or the, whatever they call it, Quorum Deo now. We're not like these big, huge churches, but, but I tell you what, there have been times I, when my office was in here, uh, I would have a knock at the door, and five minutes later, the phone would ring. Five minutes later, I'd get a text message. Five minutes later, I'd get a, converse, a, a knock on the door that, 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 it, that took a 30 minutes, and then I would get another phone call that took 10 minutes, and before long, all of your time is gone. And then there's other demands, there's building demands, and there's this demand, and then there's all of these things and these pressures, and sometimes we just need to get away from all of that, silence all of the verbal distractions, silence your phone, turn off your email. Boy, I tell you what, how, you, does your phone ding when you get a text message? Th there have been times that it sounded like my phone was detonating. And I'm like, what is that noise? And sure enough, it's my phone. I've got my, my tablet tied to my computer, which is tied to my phone, which is tied to my iWatch. And, and I hear the phone ring, and then I hear this, and then someone comes and knocks. And, and before long, you almost go into a panic attack, you know? Like, there's just so much. I just got to get away for just a moment. Sometimes we have to put on the do not disturb. Sometimes we just have to ask the folks, hey, listen, I'm just going to take a little time, and I'm going to pray to my Heavenly Father. Not only is there a pattern for focused prayer, there's also a place for focused prayer. And sometimes that is just silencing all the verbal distractions. Well, not only do we need to silence verbal distractions, we need to reduce visual distractions. Now, I know this seems almost pointless because we, we pray with our eyes closed, right? At least most of the time we pray with our eyes closed. I think that's probably one of the reasons why we pray with our eyes closed. So many, many years ago, I was at a wedding, and the person officiating the, the, uh, the I was going to call it a funeral, the wedding, 
who was officiating the wedding, they, uh, they, said, they said, I want to do something a little different here tonight. And I thought, oh, this ought to be good. They said, I want to pray with their eyes open. And you can imagine 200 people looking at this person going, with their eyes open? Like, this can't be Bible, you know? This has got to be Bible. This can't be wrong. This is heresy, you know? And, and they, said, uh, they said, we're going to pray with our eyes open. Well, you know, I don't even know what we prayed about. But I do know that someone over here, some kid is trying to start a fire with the candle in the middle of the table. I know that this person over here is pulling something out of their hair that looked like lice. I know that this person over here, I mean, you want to talk about, the, 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 I mean, that was not a reduction of visual distraction. That was an invitation. <laughs> And you know, everybody's looking at each other like this. You know, well, oh, that's a pretty boss. Look at that tie. That tie's crooked. He does it. I do a double Windsor. My tie is like straight and is crooked. And you know, I mean, you're just like off the wall, right? So I think we need to reduce our visual distraction as well as silence our verbal distractions. And we need to do that. We need to do that. Hebrews 12, 1 and 3 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Here we go, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We can look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. But we can't do that while we have all sorts of other visual distractions. We need a place of prayer where we can go and we're not bombarded by, by visual stimuli, by all of the things around us. I think marketing, marketing has really done a great job at this. They have shown us everything that we don't have but we probably need. They have, they, have, they have totally shared with us the world around us that we didn't even know existed. And how many times have you, have you sat there with your eyes open thinking about something and you immediately get distracted by something you saw? I do it. I do it. I tell people, I have to have a clean desk in my office before I study. When I, when I really get into studying, I have to have a clean desk. Or else I'll look at this stack of papers and that stack of papers. You know what? I empty the garbage can. And oftentimes, I know this is going to sound crazy, but my wife thinks I'm nuts, I vacuum the floor in my office. And if, I, if I'm in my, uh, in my Crocs and, uh, and I take my other shoes and I put them aside, I, I straighten them out. I make sure the garbage can's empty. I wipe down the desk really good and I get it all cleaned. And, and uh, if you look at my desktop on my computer, there are no icons on there. Like some people, you, you open up the, 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 the computer and it's just like, blah, like just throws up on you. I mean, there's files and folders and all this stuff and I've got that all neatly contained and there's nothing on there. I look at it, it's blank. There's just nothing. And I have to do that before I study because with all the visual distractions in our life, there's something that's going to jump off the screen and say, Joe, you know what? This is really important. And then there I'm gone. Or I'm going to be looking over there and I'll be like, what is that on the ground over there? And I'll be picking that up and I'll be throwing that away and then I'll be like, I better empty the garbage can. And then I go to my computer and poof, the hour is gone. So we need to, in a sense, reduce our visual distractions. We need to look to Jesus, not to all of the stuff that is around us. All right, Tori said again, he said, much of our modern prayer has no power in it because there is no heart in it. Let me read that again. Much of our modern prayer has no power in it because there is no heart in it. How do we put heart into prayer if we're constantly distracted by all of the sounds and visual stimuli? If, we're, if we have tons of crowds around us, if we, have, if we haven't gotten away for just a moment to pray. We need to be thinking about the things we need to think about. And how can we do that if the world around us is telling us that there's something more important? With all of the sounds and all of the sights that we see, we have to eliminate those distractions. And we have to think about the things we're thinking about. And in conclusion, let me just say this. In order to focus on prayer, 
we often need to be in solitude, but we also need to be still. We need to be still. In Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. You see, a busy life leads to a lot of burden. We have to not be as busy. And I, I tell you, it, it's, 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 it's a propensity of mine to just get busier and busier and to do more because I think, uh, I, I think more means more, right? But just because we're doing more things doesn't mean we're getting more things done. And our life gets so busy all around us. We, get, we, we, have, we, have, we have so many things that, that, that we have to do and, and, and we allow them in. We invite them in, don't we? We invite them in with all of the phone calls and all of the emails and, and then we have, a, we have social media and we have this that somebody liked and this that somebody didn't like and, and uh, we, have to, we have this and as opposed to just shutting it down for just a moment. Sometimes getting alone with God means getting away from other people. And we need a place of, of refuge. We need a place of retreat that we can go to for just even a little, just even a short period of time. You know, th this morning it was a short prayer, maybe, maybe 15, 20 minutes, probably 20 minutes of just praying and asking God on your behalf and talking to the Lord about my message. And I'm trying to focus on a message on, on, fo on the topic of focus, right? And you can imagine Satan just wants to destroy that. So my phone is exploding, right? It's melting down into the carpet. Like I have to shut everything off. I have to turn the lights off. And I just have to close my eyes, even with the lights off. And I just have to think about my relationship with God. And then I just have to talk with him and walk with him. And just love on the Lord. We are so busy in our lives today that we are burdened. And of course we want to do more things. We want to be more uh, vigilant and, 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 and more entrepreneurial and opportunistic. And, and we want to get out there. We want to win the world. But at what cost? We're going to win the world at the cost of losing or reducing our relationship with the Lord. We need time, quiet time with God. And friends, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you know, it's interesting. As many times as I give the gospel, it never gets old for me. It just doesn't get old for me. I enjoy giving the gospel, and I enjoy putting you through it. Do I know that you know the gospel? Yes, I do. Imagine, though, for just a moment, if I didn't give the gospel for six months. Six months turns into six years. Six years turns into six decades. And we begin to forget the most important thing. That the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And I'm so thankful for the gospel. I love giving the gospel and I love showing you my wallet. This is my wallet I got in Israel. I'm not going to put you through this. Let this hand represent you and me. And this wallet represent all of our sin. The Bible says God loves us but hates our sin. A lot of churches, a lot of people believe that you can just turn over a new leaf. That you can, you can just do better. That you can get baptized and this sin is taken care of. You know what Paul said? He said, God sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. It's not about baptism. It's not about giving something to the church. It's not about being in church. It's not about uh, you know, being faithful every service. Yeah, of course I would like to see that. But you know what it's about? Here's what it's about. It's about you trusting that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin. You see, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. It's not church membership. It's not water baptism. It's not, it's not uh, giving money. It's not walking an aisle or praying a prayer. The wages of sin is death. Someone had to die. And the good news, which I think is an understatement, I think is great news. The great news is that Jesus Christ came to this earth to die in your place because the wages of sin is death. 
And it's when we trust that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, and rose again, we have eternal life. The Bible says it's not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to His mercy, He saves us. He made the sin payment debt for us. Isn't that wonderful? That just never gets old. That just never gets old. I love the fact that we can know for sure where we're going when we die. I love the fact that I, that, that I can have a relationship with God while I am alive. And that one day that I will be with Him. I just absolutely love that. It'll never get old. Never stop sharing the gospel truth with people. Because when the gospel isn't shared, people don't get saved. Because it's the power of God unto salvation. Let's never be ashamed of that. Let's never be ashamed of our relationship with the Lord. And friends, if you're here today and you don't know Christ, I beg of you that you trust Christ as your Savior. And I, I look around this room, I think everybody here is saved. I, I, I don't think I'm missing anybody. But can I just share this with you? I have not arrived in my prayer life. I, I, would, I would be a liar and a fool and a hypocrite and all, everything, even though I am a liar and a fool and a hypocrite at times. You know, I mean, let's face it, we're all, we're all sinners. But here's what I'm saying. I have not arrived with my prayer life. And these, these messages are, are preached to me as much as they are to you. So let's, let's crank up our prayer life, right? Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's get away from the pressures of the world at times. Let's find our, our quiet place like the Lord did, whether it's in the wilderness, in the garden, or, or on a mountain somewhere. We just need to be away in a closet at times. In Matthew 6, we need to, we need to insulate ourselves from, from all of the, the distractions of the world, the, the, the visual and, and uh, of course, um, uh, the, the verbal ones. Sometimes we just need to just turn off the radio and tune into what God has for us. And that's going to be a wonderful thing. It's going to be a joyous time where there can be a great revival, a spiritual revival individually with every single one of us. My favorite time is my prayer time with the Lord. That is my favorite time. I can read the Word of God and I just learn a lot, but I just love talking to Him. So let's do that. Would you do that? Would you crank up your prayer life this, this week? And would you, would you find that place, maybe in your home, maybe on your property somewhere, or, or maybe just uh, the time of day is, is, is really important. Maybe it's at night, maybe it's in the morning. For me, it's the morning. And just find that time where you can get alone with God. And you can pray to Him. And you can love on Him as you're living.